She's not what you'd expect. She's tough and feisty, but gentle and tender. She makes millions and gives millions to the poor. She cries, she laughs, she teaches, she comforts. This is the Danny Johnson Show. You know, I realized I had been neglected, but th th this is crazy. This is Adam's Middle School. Oh, gosh, I know where I'm at. Yeah. I, I think this is the first time I've ever connected to the fact that they had nothing else to do. Where were my parents when we were at, at the park, at home? Where were we, where were they when we were walking ourselves to school back and forth at home? Like they had nothing to do. They were welfare recipients, they were drug addicts, and they chose to absolutely not be involved at all. Yes. Another yeah, street to cross. How awesome is that? It's crazy. This is it. This is their school? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's like a marathon for a five year old. Marathon for a 10 year old. Right? 11 year old little girls? 11 year old, 9 year old, 7 year old walking to school? Like that, that's when I was the oldest. Yeah, it was right, right before you left. Exactly. I wouldn't let Kaylee no. walk on this, this path. Oh, wow. Such a trip to today as I'm entering Washington Elementary School and feeling the relief. Oh, weird, man. Weird how our, our mind and our body has these embedded emotions, embedded memories. I remember being so scared all the time. And to step on that campus it's like, wow, what is that about? And then it just hit me, it's a flood, like all that fear. Passing all those houses, all those apartments, all the bad experiences, you know, it gets on campus, and then what? Like being bullied, like, okay, awesome. Being chased home. I can't even count how many times I was chased home. My house was there. I ran from three bullies and hid behind those bushes. What? Knocked on that woman's door and begged her to let me in. Two twin girls and one of their friends and they were so ruthless, so ruthless and made fun of us because we wore old, old hand-me-downs. So they would totally make fun of me and pick on me and call me all kinds of crazy names. But I remember running all the way from school and just walking in and banging on the door. A woman opens the door and lets me in. And another time just running into that house and hiding behind the bushes, trying to hide for them. Oh, the thing that's such a trip as I'm walking through this is I spent like so much time terrified, <laughs> so scared all the time. And the crazy thing is the result of that living that childhood is what your sisters are now. I think that's the most painful part for me. And it always has been. So just even today, like when I was walking, <laughs> First of all, I, I had no idea what could what happened to them, right? So I'm telling my story. I have no idea. I mean, we walked together to school, so, you know, but I don't know. Um, I don't know if they were, I don't know what experiences they had outside of the ones that when they were with me, you know what I mean? Um, but I do know this, that the result of our childhood and what my poor sisters and I had to endure. One ended up dead at 21 in a, um, doing a drug run for my parents. Died as a meth addict, leaving a three and a half year old behind. And then Rhonda, who I can't blame her. I can't blame her for the choices she's made. I can't to be. And honestly, I, I know I've had something to do with it because I was not nice. In high school especially, you know, my parents used to tell me to go outside and beat the crap out of them, and I did, willingly, no problem, terrible. Yeah, I feel 
horrible about that. Yeah. But honestly, like, through the years when I've thought about my sisters and what they walked through, like, it's always broken my heart, you know, the memories of Marty, who was the youngest. I remember she's 13 years old and him beating her head into the sheetrock with a towel bar. I remember hearing all the screaming and I, I hit a certain a time and age, probably around 15, 14, 15, where I just couldn't take it anymore. All of a sudden I started to stand up to him. I remember one time hearing like all this screaming and I was in my bedroom and I come out and I hear it and, and I see him like bent over. He's a huge man, right? And they're in the bathroom and I literally but we could run down the hallway and I peek over his big butt. Literally pull the tumbler off and just beat her head straight in the sheepock. So again, when I think of these kids who've grown up in great homes, like you. I can't mean, even imagine. Right? But yet you were cutting yourself at 16. You know? You think, why? Like how? Like what would bring you to that place? Or whatever, like the, the choices that kids make. And they have a great family. They have parents that adore them, parents who love them, who are devoted to them. Obviously not perfect, no human is, right? And I think largely the parents don't get thanked very much for, you know what I mean? They just don't, even once they even have kids, you know, there's not even a, a whole lot of gratitude that comes back to the parents who so loved, so devoted, so worked their butts off made lots of sacrifices. Many kids take it for granted mm -hmm. that we're not neglected. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? True. Like there's so many parents that are so committed to their kids and right. the kids just totally take it for granted. You know, that they drove their kids to school every day. We drove our kids to school every day. My kids didn't walk, to my kids didn't drive with strangers either. Like we knew, you know, if there was any carpool situation, we knew. So I think a lot of kids just like totally take that for granted. But man, when you're, when you grow up like I did, or Hans, Hans was neglected just like, yeah. just like me and my sisters, like hardcore. And I don't know that my kids realized how, like that's a concerted effort. Like that's a major commitment for a they, parent they wouldn't to, know. to yeah. they don't, you know, no. to watch over them like that. And, and then here's, know. My parents, who had nothing else to do, nothing, nothing. I didn't have a single dad. I didn't have a single mom. Like when I think about this, it's like, dang. Like, you don't want to get your stuff out of bed to walk your kids to school, and little girls, amongst not the greatest places to be walking. Uh, we we passed it. I couldn't. I, had, I stopped for a minute, but I had to keep going. There's a place where I almost was abducted. Oh, a man came down here. I'm walking this way to school, and I happened to be sick that morning. So I was coming late to school, because um, God forbid they let us stay home, let me mm -hmm. home sick. So. I don't know, it must have been like 10 o'clock in the morning or so. But anyway, so I, I'm walking this way to come to school and this um, like white creamy truck with a camper on the back of it um, crosses over. And then as I am coming across, I see he pulls into a driveway and backs up. This is a one-way street. It's, it's a one-way street, you can see it this way. So he comes down. He then pulls in and then comes right here as I am crossing the street. No way. Yeah. Wow. And he's like, hey, come here, come here. Uh, Do you want a piece of candy? 
No, thank you. Hey, I, I'm wondering if you can tell me where... He goes, come here. I, I'm going to give you something. And he was pants pulled down, Ugh. fully exposed, had a quarter, put it on his penis, and say, come on, come on, get in the truck. Oh my gosh. Come on, I want you to come with me. I'm going to take you somewhere. Let's go have some ice cream. Let's go have some fun. And I started running. <sighs> How'd you know how to run? Like, to run? I don't know. Wow. I'm scared. Yeah. Because then your parents obviously hadn't had conversations oh. with you of like, if this ever happens, you know. I had been molested well, already. Exactly. I had yeah. already been exactly. molested. No, I hadn't been molested by him yet. I, oh! He didn't ah. start until after we moved out of here. Oh, no, I was molested when I was three by a Hispanic man. Again, three years old, playing in an alley here in L.A. An apartment. Oh, my gosh. They were building probably these apartments. Yeah, they were building these apartments. And um, a man exposed himself. Mm. Hmm. Whistled at us kids. Oh. All of us were girls. And dropped his pants. What? Yes. Yes. That's disgusting. It is. Gosh, it's disgusting. But, and this is what's so sad it's is so like, disgusting. okay, so the parents who let their kids just go and walk and whatever, like they don't understand that that kind of stuff happens to their kids. And the kids don't, and the kids know don't what talk to do. about it. No, because yeah, they don't and, and, and the parents don't ask. No. The parents don't ask and the kids don't talk. Like, was there ever conversation? No. Uh, do you know, did it. anyone talk to you on the way home from right. school? Did anything happen at the park? Like, you were never given the tools to even protect yourself or... Or ask the question, right? like ask the question, right? Okay, so you let your kid go to the park by themselves, you know, three little girls, and you don't ask the question of, hey, did anyone try to talk to you? Did anybody say anything to you? Did you see anything that made you uncomfortable? No questions, mm -hmm. none, just drooling. And again, like the, the kids who have parents who do ask those questions and often are like, no, no, nothing. Like, you have any idea how blessed you were that you didn't have some man on a park bench letting his male parts stick out, trying mm. to entice you, mm. you mm. know, or somebody trying to get you mm. into their car? What a blessing. And then you think like a conversation would have happened of like, oh, well, how are they going to get to school? Oh, they can walk. You know, like, or like that decision was made, like. It's crazy. And it was like, yeah, that's fine. That's totally okay. Like, how is that? In, yeah. How is that okay? Uh, you know, when you, when you grow up like that and, and who is supposed to protect you or care about you or glad that you were born, you know, but instead you hear, see what happens when the abortion lives, it was never supposed to be born. And there you go, you, there's no purpose for you. You know what I mean? There's no, um, you're not valuable. There's no point for you to be alive. I don't know why, it, it, it's kind of always been this way for me anytime I talk about this, but I, my heart hurts for my mom, right? My heart hurts for my sisters far more than it does for me. That's where more, most of my pain for my childhood has come from, is how much my mom was beaten and how much my sisters were, even though, I mean, I was, I got it worse than my sisters did. But the, you know, seeing your mom lifeless, just picture that. And not just one time, like so many times, you know. You lift the hand and it's not moving. It's like she's dead. Like, can't tell you many times I thought my mom was dead. And I'm how old? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. 
And then beyond that, I mean, after she broke her neck, the, the beatings against her, like, they didn't happen for a few years. And then when I was 14, it all came back. Um, but even, like, heart hurts for him. How much torment he suffered from. All the guilt and the shame that drove him to more. You know what I mean? Drove him to more of the abuse and how much he hated himself. Like, my heart hurt for him as an adult. You know, once I forgave him, like, gosh, gosh, I can't imagine living in that head of his. So I think about this. I think about the my mom and the guilt and the shame that she carries. You know, I used to beg her to please leave, please leave. Take us, let's go. And I mean, obviously after she had her accident and, and she got a settlement, she could afford to leave. Was, she w He was not providing for the family, like this was her settlement money, so she could leave, but she just wouldn't leave. So it's not only they don't want to go to our games or didn't want to walk us to the park and didn't want to walk us to and from school, or wouldn't just go to the grocery store themselves. You know, I'm sure they did, but I'm just saying, like, why send me? You know, I'm seven. Like, why send me? But to not be at all engaged, involved in my life or our lives, me and my sisters. So, so I think about someone that's watching even right now and thinking about, like, that they feel like they've screwed their kids up. I think every parent worries about that. I think every parent is just so carefully concerned about how they raising their kids. And then there's some who like, they like parted their butts off or made the choices like what my parents did. And they think, oh man, I've screwed my kids up and there's no hope. Yes, there is, look at me. There is hope. There is hope. Look what God has done in my life. And you have to cling to that hope. You have to know that he can redeem all things. And no matter what choices you've made, you have to forgive yourself for the choices that you made and where you didn't realize what you were doing, but you have to totally release yourself from that because once your kids become an adult, we are totally responsible for our own choices. And so the miss I made of my life right in this hotel, right at that balcony outside this window that eventually led me to being homeless just a few months after I was the first time in this hotel, that those were my choices. The drugs I took was my choices. The people I gave my body over to were my choices. Um, the failures I made financially were my choices. Um, my first marriage failure was my choice. It was all my choice. So, but if the parent feels like they screwed up so bad, we just have to have hope and know that God can redeem all things and he does and my life is living proof that anything is possible. Anything is possible. So, whether you're the man that molested the child and you're carrying that kind of guilt or you're the mom that is carrying the guilt that you didn't make the best choices and you felt like you were selfish when your kids were little and you said things to them and about them and you really feel bad about it, release yourself, forgive yourself so you and them can heal, so God can use your... Um, confession and use your your release of yourself and the forgiveness of yourself to be able to start bringing healing into that child's life that is now an adult so and you can be forgiven i have forgiven my mom i have forgiven my dad i've forgiven my biological father for putting me in that situation so anything's possible with you Anything, 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 anything. And that's not some stupid slogan. That's not some preached out message. That's not some, like, overly, it is, an overly beaten up, like, scripture. No question. Like, it's been said so many times that, you know, like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's real. Like, it is absolutely real that anything, absolutely anything is possible with him. That's the bottom line. So, that's it. Yeah. Wow. So there's my memento from the day. We stood at Washington Elementary, uh -huh. and there was something sparkling on the ground, mm. and it looked like a shiny little, little button. Looked like a shiny little diamond to me, and mm -hmm. I thought, well, in this place, that's awesome. We had a diamond in the rough, 
Yeah. And nobody could see it. Oh, that was something else that I wanted to talk about, too. 3%. Perfect. Let's okay, keep rolling. Um, no, it's okay. It's okay. 3% is enough. You know, I think about, um, you know, walking through uh, to Washington Elementary, and I'm just one of the kids that's in someone's classroom, right? And I had this one teacher, I can't remember what his name was, he used to make fun of me and call me Dinette Set. Um, it'd be so funny if you end up watching a video like this and go, wait a second, I had a kid that I called Dinette Set. Bottom line is that I think it's profound. You guys will be able to hear you on this mic. <laughs> Shit, I'm just like, this is so awesome. I know. Um, anyway, the, um, I look at all the, well, for example, even like um, one of my, we call her a cousin. She's not physically, I mean, like biologically cousin, but she's in my life. And, um, She's come to me so many times crying, like, I had no idea. I had no idea that you guys were being beaten like this. And she goes, I should have known because I went to the hospital one time when your mom had been beaten, but I didn't know you kids were being affected. And there, and she's sorry, like, I'm so sorry. You know, they, they had their own lives, you know what I mean? How, how do you know? But my point is, is that if you're a school teacher, you have one of these kids maybe in your classroom and you don't know it. You. This kid might be on your block. These kids, these three little girls, you know, we were we were the three girls that after my mom got her settlement and then we went, they sent us to a private Christian school because my dad didn't want us to get pregnant like my mother did. I did anyway. Um, but anyway, um, I did, it was terrible. My senior year, just like she did, and I didn't know that she did, but bottom line is, is that we were those little girls that, that those fa Christian families did not allow to be played with. They didn't allow their kids to play with us. We were not good enough to hang out with their kids. Um, I had one close girlfriend, her parents let me come over and they were involved in high school. But my point is, is that these three little girls are around you right now. And they could be your niece and or it could be a little boy that's being treated like this. It could be your niece or nephew, it could be your grandchild, it could be a student in your classroom. It could be someone that you're seeing at the park. It, it could be someone that you're seeing on the basketball team. You just never know. This is why it's so important to not be the judgmental person that I was talking about at the school today, right? Oh, you know, people have this thing, like those three girls that used to beat me up and, and chase me home and make fun of me constantly because I wore hand-me-downs that were totally out of style, years older than what we were supposed to be wearing at that time. And um, to teach those kids that, and for the parents to understand, we gotta show the love of God to even us dirty kids, to us kids that you can see it all over our faces. Don't just keep to yourself. Love on them. Love on them. You never know what you're planting inside of that kid and that thing that might keep them alive or give them hope and could challenge them to have a totally different future. So I think about that a lot, that we were those kids that people didn't want to be around. So don't be those people. How are you? moving forward going to be working through all of this and what steps are you going to be taking? I definitely um, discovered today that there I've got some digger, digger, deeper forgiveness, um, some new stuff to forgive that I've not really thought about, you know, until you go there. And so it was clear that God's walking me through a, another place of freedom. You know, and just even when we decided to do this today, you know, this is not the day to do it. It's the day before walking into a first steps to success. It's not the day to be doing this. Mm -hmm. But I got up super early and all the prep was done early. And I'm like, oh, what am I going to do for the next seven hours? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so yeah. So I knew when I agreed to it that, that this would be about. And I trust him. I trust my father in heaven to walk me um, through these paths of healing and a lot of people don't want to deal with it like my sister being one of them 
um, there's a lot of people. They just don't want to deal with it. They want to stay away from those feelings. They want to bury the things from their past. They and, and not that they shouldn't, but you got to deal with those wounds. And if you don't deal with those wounds, they end up percolating to the top and then they manifest themselves in the, the most worst opportune moments. Um, and they have an impact on you. They, they, they control how you think. They control the decisions that you make. And so I, I knew when I was getting in the car and, and I knew I was like, okay, this is, I'm going to walk through some scary feelings. I'm going to perhaps uncover and discover some things that I am just not aware of that it's not in my, it's not in my conscious mind. And that's clearly what has happened in the deep, deep level of neglect. But this is, this is like another layer of I've talked about it, like, you know, they used to let us walk to school, but when you go and walk those same places and you're seeing as an adult and revisiting and feeling the emotion of the fear, the insecurity, the not cared for, the not cared about, I don't even know how to explain the not being worth the time. And I don't think it's ever hit me how they had nothing else to do. You know, could have been great parents. They could have been the parents that worked or parents that went to the park with their kid. They could have still been doing drugs and been great parents if they'd just gone with you. Exactly. You know? Exactly. If they just walked us to school, they had nothing else to do. They didn't have any other place to be. That just blows my mind. That just really blows my mind. You know, I've often seen my life as a movie reel. I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of people see their life in a kind of like in a movie totally. reel, you know, a storyboard or something. And, and um, this... Um, concept of a script that was given to me, a script of just intense fear and neglect and not being, not being valuable enough, just having no value to your mom. You know, you think your dad is, does not have any value, to not be valuable enough to want to spend any time with, but not to be valuable enough to want to hear the voice. We are constantly told to shut up, constantly getting beaten because we made a sound, to not be valuable enough or to be valued enough to be fed properly. There's some deep stuff, There's some really deep stuff. So. Here's what I know. The difference between me and my sisters is I met the Messiah when I was 13. And I really met him. And he really, really touched my life. I don't know why. Like, you know what I mean? Like, lots of people hear that story about the forgiveness and him dying on that cross for our sins. Lots of people hear it, but don't connect to it. And I don't know why my sisters didn't, and I don't know why I did. But I am so grateful. No one can tell me that he isn't real. Because I am alive because of him. I'm alive because of that revelation that I needed that. And feeling his presence when I take my horse later years after my mom broke her neck and she got a settlement and right off in a field with my Bible and even though the man that raised me would make fun of me and just curse Christians and even though he was the one that put us in that Christian school I really want to know like why did my sisters not connect do you know what I mean they heard the same chapel messages It's really heartbreaking to think 
So it's not the case that they didn't hear the gospel, they did, but they didn't have the ears to hear, they didn't have the understanding of their hearts, so why did I? I don't know. I don't know other than desperation. And when I read through the Bible, I see that a lot. I see lots of desperation. Like the woman with the issue of blood, right? There, I was reading that just this morning. Like there was a desperation in her. And then right after that story is the man whose daughter who died. You know, there's that desperation. And so when you come to him with that desperation, then, you know, then I feel maybe there, that's what causes that connection. I don't know. But how could my sisters not have that same desperation? Other than the fact that they were stealing my parents' weed and they were getting high when they were 13 and 11. So, you know, so they were already escaping and I hated drugs. I hated, I hated what those drugs had done to our life. So different, you know, different experience, I guess. I don't know, but my life really blows my mind. I shouldn't have anything that I have. I sh the script that was written for me is a messy one. It was messy. The one that my mother passed down to me is filled with curses, filled with hopelessness, filled with pain and suffering and trauma and tragedy and poverty. And that's, that's the script that I had. I was living it out completely. But it's amazing what God can do in a moment. It's crazy what he does in a moment. And at your lowest and at your weakest and at your most disgusting and in all of your absolute filth, what he does is crazy. No one can tell me that he's not real. Nobody can tell me that. You could fight about the Bible all you want. You cannot tell me that Jesus isn't real. That the Father sent him like you cannot you can argue me with that because I would be dead without knowing my true father in heaven and my true identity and the real script that was written for my life the real story that I had to make the choice to live out that I had to choose him and choose to believe and choose to be healed that horrifying fear that drove me to suicidal places. So as I'll choose today to allow him to bring a deeper healing inside of me, uh, that inner child of mine who was not valued at all, that had no value to the people who were raising me. So. One more thing that popped in my head is for people watching who have something crazy and horrifying in their past and it's something that they can revisit whether it's a physical location or just like a state of mind or like even just revisiting a decision that they made or something they did do you what do you what do you think is like should they revisit those things should they if they haven't if they are like at peace, should they go digging again? Like, what is your perspective on that? I think that um, I'm certainly not an expert in my own opinion about it. I just know my own journey. And I ask God to heal me often. And I ask him to reveal to me what it is that is hindering me, stopping me, what has to change in me in order to get to where he wants me to go. Because I don't want to do anything that would hinder his work in my life or through my life, right? So many lives have been changed. And I'm the last person in the world that was supposed to succeed. Truly only here because of him. And I truly only have the responsibilities I have of a company that I have, a com companies that I've had all these years, you know, 30 years that I've been in business this year. That's nuts. That's freaking nuts. But as far as revisiting, like, this was about him. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? This was him um, answering the prayer of God, show me what needs to change in me. Show me... Um, 
what I need to be healed from or what sin I need to be forgiven from or I I want to know you know what I mean I don't I don't want um, I don't want my life to be hindered and because I've seen the amazing fruit from allowing him to take me to those places in my childhood and the deliverance that I've had from things I didn't even know I needed to be delivered from I trust him I trust him and I trust that journey you know what I mean I trust that path of of um, closure and um, the path the journey of being healed or restored or having a different perspective brought as an adult looking back you know what I mean so um, I think that many of us have bitterness tucked inside of us that we don't know about and I really believe I know for me like there is so much filth inside of my heart um, all from my past that that I don't know about there's stuff that has been revealed to me that like wow that's really nasty um, and then there's stuff that I'm sure that I'm currently doing that is still there that I don't even know about and I, there's probably fruit in my life that I can't even see that's there you know what I mean I think most of us what we what we do that we're not proud of or or habits or you know I know I can be insanely annoying to people I know that I can be um, I, I know I can aggravate people um, and I just yesterday was praying about that like wow I probably aggravate a lot of people I probably am annoying probably to my husband more than anybody the poor guy you know so as I start searching through those things of that you know there's probably a lot of people that put up with me and that's that's a horrible thought it's a really horrible thought and I don't want anyone to be annoyed by me or um, be agitated by me so I'm I'm always searching those things out and I rather uh, be healed than to stay stuck I rather be free than to be blind and in bondage. To be in bondage and not know it. You know what I mean? And so you just kind of accept the script because you're actually in bondage and you don't even know it because you're blind to what has bound you up. So I've experienced so much healing in my life from him. I've experienced so much freedom from him and so much deliverance from habits and things I used to think and torments that I lived with for so long so I know the benefit of taking my father his hands and just going okay I trust you let's go ahead let's go let's go walk through this journey and see what's there and and forgive and release everyone who was involved and, and bless every single one of them and choose to be clean choose to be whole and choose for my life to be um, a conduit of his love you know what I mean to be I don't want anything to constrict his love flowing through me I just don't so yeah, so I think that people should ask him. You know what I'm saying? So don't ask me. I'm a flawed, freaking messed up human. <laughs> so don't ask me. And to be honest with you, if you ask your counselor, it's a good chance your counselor is a flawed, messed up person too. And same with your psychologist and your therapist. They're all jacked up. Trust me, I've had them at first steps. <laughs> like seriously, I can't tell you how. And coaches, you know, let's add the the so-called coaches into the mix. Because they, they are in our seminars, <laughs> and they are writing the question of, I have this thing that I'm doing, like, I'm blown away, and you're a counselor, <laughs> and you're a psychologist, <laughs> and you're a coach. Okay, this is awesome. I'm proud of you for being here, and I'm proud of you for having the humility mm -hmm. to ask the question instead of trying to act like you have it all together, because none of us have it all together. Mm -hmm. So I would say, don't ask me. Don't ask your counselor. Don't ask your coach. Ask God. Ask him, like, okay, show me. What what am I in bondage to that I don't even know? Mm -hmm. What what wounds do I have that I haven't dealt with that I've just, like, covered up and, you know, try to pacify or try to hide? And, but what do you want to heal me from? What, what do you want to do in my life? Um, 
what's hindering me, what's stopping me, what's holding me back. People ask that question every single event that we do, every first steps every night and days. It's like the most common question of like, what's holding me back? I'm like, and I'm supposed to know. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> like, I don't know. Am I supposed to know what's holding you back? I don't live with you. I don't see you. Yeah. Like, ask God. <laughs> he will give you the answer. I promise. Yeah. So he promises to give the answer. If you ask, he will, mm-hmm. he'll give you the answer. So, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's a really good idea. Just from personal experience, but you know, God will be the one to show you.